It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Matt Nystoriak, who is an assistant professor of medicine for today's endocrine seminar. Matt received his bachelor's in biology with a minor in chemistry from the University of Vermont, where he also did a PhD in pharmacology. And during the time he was a graduate student, he was awarded an American Heart Association pre-doctoral fellowship. He did postdoctoral training at the University of Washington and then at UC Davis, where he was also funded by an American Heart Association fellowship on AKAP 150, Dependent Mechanisms of Diabetic Vascular Dysfunction. He joined U of L in 2015 as an assistant professor in the term track and converted to the tenure track in September 2019. He's an author of 37 peer-reviewed research publications, including a recent paper on metabolic regulation of KB channels and cardiac repolarization by KB beta-2 subunits in, in Journal of Molecular and Cellular Cardiology. He's PI on an NIH R01 grant, Regulation of Coronary Blood Flow, as well as an American Heart Association grant. He's a co-investigator on two other grants, notably with a project in the Center for Excellence in Diabetes and Obesity Research on cyclic AMP, PKA signaling, and diabetic vascular dysfunction. In addition, um, he has a very high scoring application that's under review for, uh, at NIH. He's mentored high school and undergraduate, as well as graduate students in his lab, and he's currently mentoring two faculty members. We're glad to have you here to talk with us today and tell us about your research and its relationship to diabetes, we hope. Thank you so much. All right. Talk. All right. Thanks so much, Gary, for that uh, kind introduction. Um, and thank you all for, for being here physically and for those of you uh, virtually. Um, so I, I want to thank you again for the invitation to, to present today. It's, it's actually really nice. Um, it, it actually feels great to be talking about science in a place other than my office and, and kitchen, um, at home. But, um, you know, I hope everyone's staying, uh, safe and healthy through, uh, all of this. And so, um, as Kerry mentioned, so I, I've been working uh, uh, a lot on this project and, and I've become very interested in, in the regulation of myocardial blood flow. I was told I could take this off now, actually, so I don't go hypoxic. But um, so, yeah, so we've been working on, on this project recently. So I, I have a lot of experience um, in doing uh, research on, on diabetic vascular dysfunction, and I've been working on a lot of that in my postdoc. Um, I'm going to touch on that a little bit at the end of this talk um, and, and hopefully bring it back to why it's important uh, uh, for uh, uh, an endocrin endocrinology uh, seminar. Um, but it, it's really going to focus a lot on, on uh, uh, physiological regulation of, of myocardial blood flow uh, at the, the molecular level and how it's regulated by metabolism. Um, and, and so I want to make the connection there to how it could be affected uh, in different disease states that could alter metabolism. Uh, not advancing here. There we go. Okay. So first to start, I have uh, no financial uh, interest to disclose. Um, so, as an outline uh, of the talk, the talk could be really divided into the three major sections. So, first, I want to introduce uh, the basic uh, uh, health burden of, of coronary microcirculatory dysfunction and why we're, we're interested in this and, and really what the major gaps in knowledge are uh, that led us to, to do the work that we're doing right now. Um, then the second part of the talk, I want to focus on, on physiological regulation of coronary blood flow, and I want to focus specifically uh, on, um, I think it's this one, right? Yep. On uh, some new data that we have that implicate a, a protein that interacts with a voltage gated potassium channel as a, a mediator of, of vasodilation uh, in the heart and how it could regulate hyperemia or increases in blood flow uh, responding to changes in myocardial metabolism. And then at the final uh, part of the talk, focus on how uh, this can actually be uh, uh, intertwined in, in uh, cardiac 
with health, and in particular with cardiac growth and, and physiologic growth of the heart, uh, and in particular uh, with respect to exercise conditioning and how uh, we think and some of our data uh, support a, a role for some of this metabolic sensing by these, these uh, proteins that interact with these channels in the vasculature and how they could actually be crucial for remodeling of the heart uh, during health and, and possibly um, uh, in disease. So to get started in terms of uh, significance to uh, public health, um, uh, so ischemic heart disease is, is of course, a, still a major, uh, continues to be a major problem. So ischemic heart disease is uh, defined broadly as an in inadequate delivery of oxygen uh, to the heart muscle. Um, so again, this, this continues to be a, a major problem. This is a, a GIF from, from the CDC website showing uh, changes in uh, heart disease mortality in the U.S. Uh, by county um, uh, from 1973 to 2010. So you can kind of see how it's it's moved around a bit and gone up and down in certain areas and, and kind of moved around the country. And, and it, it still uh, continues to be a, a major uh, health problem. Um, it's uh, responsible for around one in every four deaths. Um, so normally when people think ischemic heart disease, uh, they think uh, one of the major causes, of course, is obstructive coronary artery disease. So this is characterized uh, by a, a buildup in, of atherosclerotic plaques that can actually obstruct uh, blood flow through some of the major conduit vessels that uh, supply blood to the myocardium. But more uh, data over the past 10 years or so has, has led to uh, more recognition of, of uh, non-obstructive uh, coronary disease and, and uh, microvascular disease uh, in the heart actually contributing to uh, significant uh, rates of ischemic heart disease in people uh, that actually don't have obstructive uh, coronary arteries uh, due to plaques. And so there's been a new uh, term given to this called uh, uh, MINOCA, which uh, is an acronym for myocardial infarction with non-obstructive coronary arteries. So it's it's been shown, and again, this is a, a very recent uh, that it's been recognized that it, it can actually contribute to um, a significant number of, of MI, uh, MIs um, and in particular, it affects people that are, are relatively young, uh, and, and certainly more women uh, than men are, are affected by this. And so, uh, what I want to uh, make the point on here is that it's 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 being more uh, recognized as a significant contributor to ischemic heart disease, and we really don't have a, a good understanding of what actually causes this. Um, so, this is a statement uh, that's on the NIH uh, website about molecular changes in the small blood vessels. So the causes of coronary microvascular disease are not fully clear. They may involve molecular changes in the small vessels of the heart, uh, part of the normal aging process. Uh, but I just wanted to point out, you know, how, how vague some of these statements are. There's changes that can affect the way genes and proteins are controlled inside of cells. And the changes mean that the small arteries of the heart may not respond correctly when they receive signals indicating that the heart needs more oxygen-rich blood, such as when a person is physically active. So instead of expanding to allow more blood, the size of these vessels doesn't change or may even decrease. And so I think one of the reasons that we don't have uh, very effective treatment options for people that have this, this microcirculatory uh, dysfunction um, and, and uh, leading to ischemic heart disease because we, we actually don't understand uh, very much about this process. And, and I believe that's actually because we, we really still don't know very much about how uh, the, the heart actually uh, regulates blood flow even under a normal physiological state. So what actually makes the, the heart kind of a unique organ, so I, I want to go into a little bit of, of background on this because this is something that's been studied for quite a long time, but there's still major uh, uh, gaps in knowledge on this. One of the things that makes the heart a, a unique organ is how much oxygen it actually extracts from the arterial blood supply, even at rest. So this is, is a study from the 70s done in, in uh, instrumented dogs showing uh, arterial uh, oxygen saturation and, and venous uh, oxygen saturation. And so you could see even at low levels of myocardial uh, oxygen consumption rates, you get about a 70% uh, extraction of, of oxygen from the arterial blood supply. And so what this means is that when myocardial oxygen consumption increases, there's actually very little reserve to extract more oxygen from, from the arterial blood. And so the way that this oxygen consumption is met 
is by uh, very drastic increases in coronary blood flow. So uh, in order for this to, to happen, in response to this increase in heart rate and contractility and increase in O2 uh, consumption and demand, there needs to be a very rapid uh, arterial and arterial or dilation uh, that can quickly lead to an increase in blood flow to, to meet this uh, uh, demand for, for more oxygen. So again, this has been studied for, for decades, but, but we're still, there's still major gaps in knowledge that I'll, I'll point out in a minute. And, and this is really something that we've uh, really been interested in the, in the past few years at trying to understand better. So just as a schematic overview, uh, you can imagine that, that this is a, a highly regulated process, uh, uh, hy hyperemia uh, in the heart. Um, and uh, there, there's a lot of redundancy in these systems in order to, to match uh, uh, oxygen supply and demand in the heart, but, but how these all actually uh, work is, is not well known. Um, but basically, we're focused on, on this aspect here, uh, where an increase in, in myocardial metabolism can lead to uh, some production of metabolites that can lead to the mes metabolic vasodilation of arterioles. And so, you know, how this process works is, is uh, what we're focused on. And there's been many purported uh, metabolites that have, have been uh, proposed to, to contribute to the response. Uh, changes in O2 and CO2 tensions, uh, production of potassium, uh, uh, adenosine uh, is another one uh, um, produced by uh, uh, more active cardiomyocytes, adenine nucleotide superoxide, uh, and ACO2 that's coming from the mitochondria and the cardiomyocytes. Um, and, and certainly there's a lot of evidence to support that all of these could be playing a, a, particip a participating role. Um, but what, we're, uh, what we've been focused on is downstream of these, uh, how does the uh, vasculature actually uh, transduce the signal into uh, the dilation and actually uh, leading to an increase in blood flow? And so we've been focused on, on the role for uh, several ion channels. Uh, and in particular, uh, we've been focused on uh, voltage-gated potassium channels that are expressed uh, in the smooth muscle cells of the coronary arterial wall. So uh, the reason we're focused on these is because these channels, these, these voltage-gated potassium channels or KV channels of, of the KV1 family have been shown to be uh, a prominent regulators of membrane potential in the, the vascular smooth muscle cells in the arterial wall. And so when these channels open, they, they open in response to a depolarization uh, of the membrane. And when the channels open, you get potassium efflux, and that efflux can lead to a feedback uh, against this membrane potential depolarization, so you'd get a, a more negative membrane potential. This would decrease the activity of voltage-dependent calcium channels and decrease the calcium in the cell, and that would relax the, the vascular smooth muscle, leading to a, a, a vasodilatory uh, response. Uh, this is a classical example of, of how these channels uh, participate in the tonic regulation of uh, vascular tone. So this is a diameter measurement in a, in a, art, in a cerebral artery uh, that's been uh, cannulated and pressurized. And so the, the artery has, has myogenic tone that's developed. And then if you apply, apply a, an inhibitor of a KV1 channel for aminopyridine, you get this uh, immediate um, decrease in diameter or a vasoconstriction. You can see, you can watch this out and do it with a higher uh, uh, concentration of 4-AP. You see this, uh, again, this uh, significant constriction. Um, and this, you can see, uh, will decrease the diameter over a range of physiological intravascular pressures um, that are applied to the vessel. Uh, so what this ultimately suggests is that there's a, a very significant tonic regulation or opposition of, of uh, vasoconstriction that these channels are playing in these vessels. So there's uh, uh, data from within the past uh, six or seven years or so that suggests that these channels are crucial for uh, regulating myocardial blood flow. And so uh, this is some work out of uh, Bill Chilean's lab in Ohio showing that uh, this is uh, blood flow measured in vivo in mice, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. So you can see this normal uh, response as you increase cardiac workload. You see this, this increase in, in uh, myocardial blood flow. And in mice that are, are lacking KV1.5 channels, uh, you can see that it significantly blunts this blood flow response to increasing cardiac uh, workload. And when you reconstitute uh, the channel only in smooth muscle cells, you can actually rescue uh, the blood flow response. 
Uh, it's been shown in larger animals as well. This was done in, in uh, exercising uh, pigs, um, showing that when uh, you apply corioide, which is another blocker, a more selective blocker of KV1 channels, you can actually uh, suppress blood flow across this range of, of myocardial uh, oxygen uh, consumption. So the question that we uh, uh, had when we started seeing some of these papers is how do these vascular KV channels actually sense changes in, in myocardial oxygen demand to regulate blood flow to the heart? So it turns out that uh, there's quite a lot of literature on, on how these channels that are in the membrane of, of the vascular smooth muscle cell can actually be regulated by a number uh, of different uh, redox uh, conditions uh, in the cell. Uh, it's been shown to be regulated by uh, peroxy nitride production, superoxide, and, and uh, uh, um, hydrogen peroxide, um, um, and also by changes in pyridine nucleotide uh, redox state, which uh, is what I'm going to focus on today because we know that uh, changes in oxygen tension and, and also a number of uh, circulating or secreted factors can si significantly uh, impact the metabolism of the cell pretty, pretty quickly to, to change the redox state. Uh, of these nucleotides. Um, so if we look at the structure of the channel, and so how, how can the channel actually sense these, these changes in impurity nucleotide redox? Uh, so the channel structure is actually formed by, by four uh, alpha subunits that actually sit in the membrane of the cell. These actually uh, subunits contain the voltage sensor of the channel and, and the potassium selective pore. Uh, to allow uh, potassium efflux, and then these, uh, this uh, tetramer is actually found in association with another tetramer, uh, which is the ancillary uh, complex of KV beta subunits. And so, um, so these are, are uh, uh, intracellular subunits that actually act as regulatory subunits for the the, the voltage sensitive pore of the channel. And so. In the late 90s, uh, some, some papers came out that actually found that the, the members of, of these KV beta proteins actually belong to uh, the superfamily of aldo reductases. And so these are actually uh, functional uh, enzymes that can actually uh, they catalyze the reduction of a number of carbonyl compounds. And to do this, they actually bind to um, uh, pyridine nucleotides, either NADPH or, or NADH, to convert these uh, aldehydes or ketones to, to alcohols. And so this has uh, been a kind of a fascination in the field, uh, you know, and, and the question has remained really, what are these uh, subunits actually there for and what do they do? Um, and uh, because these channels are expressed not only in, in uh, smooth muscle cells, but really all, all excitable cell types have these. Um, so um, the cofactor, they, these uh, subunits all bind uh, to purity nucleotide uh, cofactors in, in, with KDs in the low uh, micromolar range. Uh, and they all have uh, a catalytic, catalytic activity, at least with purified proteins. Um, but the, the catalytic activity seems to be much slower than other members of, of uh, the AKR family. So again, the question has remained, uh, what are the physiological roles? Um, so they've been shown to be involved in structural and, and chaperone functions and also functional regulation of the channel uh, through actually sensing uh, redox conditions of the cell. And so uh, this is the one that I really wanna focus on mostly today. Um, so when we set out on this project, we actually didn't know what was even expressed in the coronary vasculature in terms of these uh, members of these KV beta subunits. So they belong to, to typically uh, uh, three uh, different genes, um, which are found at, uh, in different uh, splice variants, uh, so different uh, variants of the beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3. Um, and uh, one of the interesting things about the, the KV1 members is that both the alpha subunits that make up the pore of the channel and the beta subunit complex that makes up this auxiliary complex can actually form uh, uh, heterotetramers. So in other words, you wouldn't typically see in a native channel all of the KV1.5 channels that are all found within the alpha domain binding to a, a, a homotetramer of, of beta 2, it's actually going to be a mix of these. So this has actually been one of the challenges in the field of, of how these actually will integrate to regulate channel function. So we started looking and just doing basic Western blots with isolated coronary arteries from mice and, and comparing these to the to brain tissue because uh, these channels are highly expressed in the brain. Uh, and what we found was at the protein level, we could see uh, uh, evidence of, of KV beta 1 and beta 2 
uh, abundance, and then uh, very little beta-3, which is known to be uh, prominently expressed in the brain. And so the question we had first was which of these are interacting uh, with the KV-1 uh, channels in, in these native channel complexes in the arterial myocytes. And so uh, the way we went about looking at this is because we had so little tissue, again, we're using uh, coronary arteries for mice, so we didn't have a lot of material to run uh, co-immunoprecipitation experiments. What we actually went to uh, was another technique known as in situ proximity ligation. And so with this, we're using a dual antibody labeling and actually, uh, instead of a, a four or a, a HRP bound uh, secondary uh, antibody, you actually uh, have uh, oligodeoxynucleotides that can be ligated if they're within very close proximity, so within about 40 nanometers uh, of each other. Um, and then you can actually label these uh, with 4 or So basically, this is a method to, to uh, detect uh, proteins that are within very close proximity, such as they would be in a, a native protein complex. Um, so what we did was we first labeled for KB1.5, which again is, is one of the poor forming, uh, major poor forming subunits, and then the different uh, beta subunits and isolated coronary arterial myocytes. And what we found was that uh, we had evidence of, of beta-1 and beta-2 uh, interacting with KB1.5. Uh, consistent with our Westerns, we saw very little uh, beta-3 interacting with 1.5. But then, again, because we know that these in the brain can form heterotetramers, we also looked at interactions between beta-1 and beta-2. And we saw that, indeed, there was evidence that these were also interacting within the same complexes in these cells. Um, and these are to show specificity of the assay for these, because in the beta 1.1 knockouts that we have, or the beta 2 knockouts that we have, we actually lost uh, the signal suggesting that these two are, are uh, coming within very close proximity in, in a channel complex uh, in these cells. So to get to the major uh, questions, or the first questions we asked, uh, so again, one thing we we know from, from the literature is that sustained cardiac pump function uh, actually requires KV1-mediated coronary vasodilation to sustain its activity. And so one of our first uh, major hypotheses that we, were, uh, that we tested was that deletion of, of these KV-beta proteins can impact the metabolic hyperemia uh, response and the maintenance of cardiac performance under stress. So we set out uh, uh, looking at this uh, by doing a series of, of uh, in vivo experiments that we collaborated with uh, Bill Chilian's lab in, in Ohio on because uh, they uh, are experts on doing uh, contrast echocardiography to measure uh, myocardial blood flow. Uh, so for this, uh, we did uh, uh, these measurements in wild type and then our knockouts of KB beta 1.1 or KB beta 2 uh, mice. Uh, and we used uh, contrast echocardiography using a burst replenishment uh, protocol in which, uh, so these are, are uh, echogenic uh, lipid uh, shelled uh, um, uh, microbubbles that basically uh, uh, you can uh, give to the mouse intravenously um, and then you can see them uh, light up by echo and then you can actually use a high power ultrasound to uh, create a destruction of the signal. And then the replenishment of that signal is actually used to calculate the, the perfusion rate of, of the tissue. So an example of um, one of the, the uh, time profiles for this experiment, uh, and each of these mice is shown down here. So this is after the, the, the burst of the signal, and you can see the replenishment of the signal over time. You can use a single phase exponential function to fit these data to actually uh, estimate um, myocardial blood flow. And so what we found in our initial experiments was that in comparison to uh, a background strain matched uh, wild type mice, uh, we saw different responses for the different uh, two different uh, knockouts of these beta subunits uh, that we have. Uh, so first, as you can see here, and it's somewhat apparent in this uh, replenishment graph, you can actually see a, a trend towards uh, improved uh, blood flow uh, with the lack of the, the KV beta 1.1 uh, subunit, whereas with the, the beta 2 knockout, you see that the, the blood flow response is significantly suppressed, similar to what what we saw uh, uh, or, or what was observed with the KB 1.5 knockout. So again, that's the 1.5 knockout. Sure, go ahead. Um, are these knockouts specific for the coronary microvessels? The, these aren't, these are global knockouts, but I'll show some data later on um, to suggest that this is still due to, to loss of it in the, in the smooth muscle cell. Um, and again, 
so we these were global knockouts but with the 1.5 knockout those were global knockouts but what they did in that study was they actually used a, a, a double transgenic model to allow inducible uh, reconstitution of a subunit only in smooth muscle and it actually completely rescued the the blood flow effect so so we think the the loss of, of this function is due to the loss of the function in, in the smooth muscle cell I was thinking, is that where you think they have effects downstream? That's right, right. I will say in this experiment, too, these are done in the presence of, of hexamethonium uh, as an autonomic blockade to, to prevent, you know, differences in barrel reflex responses and things like that. Um, but we did, I'll show the data later in the talk, we actually have created a more specific model to, to look at this. Uh, so I, I'll, I will show that in, in a little bit. Um, but again, also similar to what they uh, observed in the, the 1.5 knockout, um, this shows uh, uh, some, some echocardiographic data showing that when you drive higher cardiac workloads with increasing doses of, of norepinephrine, uh, what you see is an increase in, in uh, cardiac uh, performance. So this is showing ejection fraction. And then this is steady state ejection fraction after, sev after several minutes of infusion of, of norepinephrine, and what we see was a decline in, in the ejection fraction uh, in the beta-2 knockout uh, animals. And you could also see evidence of this when you look at the uh, arterial pressure uh, trace. Uh, so in a wild-type mouse, when you give a high dose of norepinephrine, uh, you can see an increase in the pressure response that's maintained over the course of the uh, drug administration, whereas in the beta-2 knockout, you see an increase, but then it starts to decline uh, over time. So this is actually indicative of, of uh, acute pump failure uh, in these animals, and we think that this is due to uh, inadequate blood flow to the heart um, when you, you drive a higher metabolic demand. Uh, certainly, to go back to this study, um, from uh, Bill's group, um, when uh, norepinephrine is given to the KV 1.5 knockouts, you can actually see that these uh, the myocardium is is uh, hypoxic compared to a wild type and the this RC, which is that's the reconstituted group where the channel is reconstituted in smooth muscle cells, uh, suggesting that that channel is if you don't have KV1 mediated dilation, the heart will become uh, hypoxic due to a, an imbalance between uh, oxygen supply and, and uh, demand. So based on this and what we found, uh, we proposed uh, that the loss of beta-2 can actually impact the oxygen sensitivity of coronary arterial tone. So the way we looked at this is we did a series of, of experiments in which we actually were able to isolate uh, single uh, coronary uh, arteries from these mice. So this is uh, from an older paper showing the, the left uh, coronary arteries uh, that supply blood to uh, uh, the, the left ventricle. Um, this is uh, showing uh, an image of some of the vessels we used for these experiments. And so what we did was we uh, uh, carefully isolated these vessels and we actually uh, uh, were able to cannulate them on these uh, very small glass micropipettes which allows us to tie them. And then what we can do is actually pressurize the, the lumen of the vessel to intravascular, uh, physiological intravascular pressure. Then we can actually use video edge detection to track changes in arterial diameter uh, over time. And so one of the first things uh, we looked at was whether these uh, vessels can actually uh, constrict in the same degree, uh, to the same degree as, as a vessel that's uh, from a wild type uh, animal and they can. So this is a uh, thromboxane analog uh, that causes vasoconstriction, and we see a similar uh, vasoconstriction there. And also, if we uh, use a high level of potassium to induce constriction, uh, we didn't see any differences uh, there. So suggesting that the downstream of calcium influx and the way the the muscle actually handles calcium uh, to induce a contraction and a vasoconstriction is similar. So then we actually uh, performed some experiments in which we lowered the oxygen concentration in, in the bath. Um, in this case, uh, we were going from, uh, we measured oxygen, we were going from around 19% uh, or so down to about 3%. And when we do this, we can actually see this very rapid uh, increase in, in arterial diameter of these vessels. Um, so this signifies a, a vasodilation. If you wash oxygen back into the bath, you can, act, you can see it, uh, the diameter come right back down. You can repeat this. And so this is a well-known, a well well-established uh, hypoxia-induced dilation that occurs basically in every resistance vessel outside of the pulmonary uh, circulation. 
we tested this in the, the KV beta 2 null uh, coronary arteries, and what we found, uh, which is consistent with the blood flow data that we have, is that the hypoxia-induced dilation was significantly blunted. And so this is shown in the summary data here. This is plotting a, 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 amount, a decrease in diameter. This is the level of vasoconstriction. When we uh, apply hypoxia, you can see that this uh, goes down, uh, which is the vasodilation, so they're less constricted, and then uh, the, the level of, of constriction actually remains uh, uh, not uh, significantly different in the, the KB beta 2 null uh, arteries. Uh, and this is just plotting it a different way, looking at hypoxia induced uh, dilation in the wild type and the, and the beta 2 null animal. So, um, Again, this is consistent with, with some defect in the way the vessels can actually respond to uh, metabolic stress, and in this case, uh, hypoxia. So, so we found what it looks like is that there, there seems to be this divergent functional regulation of the channel by these two different beta uh, subunits that we know interact with these channels that mediate this blood flow response. And so, you know, the next question is why do they seem to be doing different things? Um, and so, what we think uh, uh, could be happening if we look at, at the structure of these uh, different beta subunit species that actually uh, interact with the channel, um, what's known is that there's a, a, a rather large uh, conserved uh, C-terminal domain, and this is actually where the, the aldo-keto-reductase uh, catalytic site is and the nucleotide binding domain is. Where these really differ is in their end termini. And what makes uh, draw your attention uh, to the beta 2s and the beta 1s, um, what makes uh, these two uh, distinct from each other is that the beta 2s are, are a bit shorter, and that's because they actually lack a ball and, and chain uh, inactivation domain that's actually found on all of the beta 1 uh, subunits. And so this is a, a ball and chain inactivation that's known to occlude the pore of the channel. Uh, when the channel becomes active, this, this ball can actually quickly inactivate the channel, um, and then it goes back to a closed state, which allows it to open again uh, and, and proceed to the open state. And so what's also known is that these, uh, the way that the beta subunits can actually regulate the channel is actually uh, largely dependent on, on the redox state of the, the purity nucleotide that's bound. And so that's why we think that not only these can actually act as sensors of metabolism through sensing purity nucleotide redox, but they're also heteromeric uh, structures and, and their contribution to actually how they regulate the channel actually depends on, on which uh, subunits are actually found uh, in complex. But together, our, our, our findings suggest that the beta-2 uh, function actually contributes to the vasodilation under conditions of reduced uh, tissue oxygen uh, uh, tension. Uh, and we think that that's because it lacks, it specifically lacks this N-terminal inactivation domain. And so if it lacks this, the channel uh, uh, quite possibly could be open longer, increasing the open prob probability of the channel. And again, potassium efflux will actually serve to hyperpolarize the membrane potential, decrease intracellular calcium, and that's the stimulus for a vasodilatory uh, response. So our, our working model that we have uh, right now is that cardiac workload and increased uh, oxygen consumption can change this purity nucleotide uh, redox state, and that's uh, what can influence KV1 uh, activity lead to hyperpolarization and, and lower calcium and, and increased blood flow ultimately. And so the next part of the talk, I want to focus on these two parts of this pathway. First, uh, we focused on does a, a change in, in cardiac workload or uh, an increase in, in uh, myocardial oxygen consumption actually influence uh, the redox state of NADH or NADPH in, in uh, the cells of the coronary wall? And so the way we looked at this first, is we subjected two, two groups of mice to either uh, a high cardiac work uh, stimulus, which was dobumine, which is a, a beta adrenergic receptor uh, uh, agonist, uh, to drive higher cardiac work. You can see that here in this uh, heart rate graph. Uh, and then we gave another group of mice PBS just as a, a vehicle. And then we quickly excised, uh, uh, snap froze the hearts, and excised uh, uh, the hearts from the animal 
And then we were collaborating with uh, Van the Vanderbilt Mass Spectrometry uh, Facility. Um, so we were very fortunate to have them, uh, or to have them as a, as a collaborator because they're really the, the leaders in the field of high resolution imaging mass spectrometry. And so what that allowed us to do was to look at, at high spatial resolution um, levels of metabolites in uh, not only the myocardium, but really to try to zero into the, the coronary wall. And so what we did was uh, we took hearts from the low and high cardiac work group and we actually uh, looked at lactate and pyruvate. Uh, the reason we did this is because to look directly for NADH and NAD with, with uh, MALDI uh, mass spect imaging, um, these are very uh, labile uh, species and we actually uh, uh, had to use lactate to pyruvate as a surrogate. Um, but it's well established that lactate to pyruvate ratio is closely uh, reflective of, of NADH to NAD levels uh, through uh, uh, in equilibrium with the uh, lactate dehydrogenase reaction. And what we found was that in the wall, the coronary wall here, which was identified in these uh, HNE uh, stain sections, we actually could observe, I think it's most apparent here in the wall of these coronary vessels, you can actually see a significant increase in the lactate to pyruvate ratio um, in hearts that were excised from these high cardiac work group. So this actually uh, suggests this lactate to pyruvate ratio, which again was used as a surrogate for NADH to NAD uh, ratio is elevated in the, in the coronary arterial wall at higher workloads. We're also doing a, a number of experiments right now uh, using a, a biosensor that can uh, uh, image in live cells NADH to NAD redox state. So these are using these uh, genetically encoded uh, biosensors that were uh, generated by Gary Yellen's lab. I won't spend too much time on this um, because they're, they're still, these experiments are still in progress, but this is an example of one of the experiments we were doing early on uh, where we were uh, expressing this biosensor that can detect NADH in these, uh, this is an aortic uh, vascular smooth muscle cells and we're altering the lactate pyruvate ratio. And you can see the response in the green to red. Uh, the red, the M-cherry is, is on uh, the sensor as, as for normalization and you can see a, a significant decrease in, in uh, the green to red ratio. Uh, responsive to lactate to pyruvate. And in this case, this is an example trace of uh, one early experiment we did where we took uh, conditioned buffer from induced pluripotent stem cell uh, derived cardiomyocytes that were paced at two and a half hertz, and we put the conditioned buffer on and, and measured uh, changes in, in um, uh, NADH to NAD. And you can actually see this and actually reverse it when you put pyruvate to drive the reaction in, in the opposite direction. Uh, so this is something we're, we're currently working on. We're, it's a bit early, but we're very excited about uh, our results with this uh, because it will ultimately, ultimately allow us to really look at some of the, the mechanisms behind what's driving these, these changes in NADH to NAD that we're seeing in vivo. Um, but the next question that I wanted to talk about is, is the next part of this pathway, how does this uh, a change in NADH to NAD actually impact the function of these native KV1 channels in, in the coronary myocytes? So this is where we got into doing uh, some uh, uh, patch clamp electrophysiology experiments. And so in this case, we were measuring, uh, uh, this is outward current measured uh, in isolated uh, uh, myocytes from, from the coronary vessels from these mice. And what we did here was we put on lactate to, uh, in this case, drive the lactate dehydrogenase reaction to increase the NADH to NAD level in the cell. And so what we're doing is, is measuring the outward current in response to this uh, increase in lac uh, NADH when we apply lactate and shift the, the reaction in this direction. And you can see that the current density uh, or this outward current is, is acutely increased by, by the application of 10 millimolar lactate. And uh, our data suggests that if you apply, apply pyruvate to shift this in the opposite direction, you can actually reverse this uh, back down. Um, we're also plotting the, so these graphs basically show the, the voltage dependence of, of the activation of the channel. Uh, so this basically tells you how sensitive the channel is to changes in voltage. Um, so what we see, in addition to an increase in current density, what this plot shows us is that the channel is actually more active uh, or is activated by more negative membrane potentials when it's in the presence of lactate. So it's more sensitive to depolarization, basically. And again, this is, is uh, reversed with, with uh, pyruvate. 
So based on this, we asked uh, the question, does coronary arterial uh, KV1 channel activity respond to NADH? Uh, so again, this is with lactate and pyruvate, um, but we uh, did another series exper of experiments to address whether NADH itself actually regulates the channel. So for this, we went to a different uh, configuration uh, of the patch clamp technique, and I'll go kind of quickly through this uh, for the sake of time. But basically, these experiments uh, show us that we're able to record from single KV1 channels uh, in uh, uh, basically membrane patches from these uh, coronary uh, arterial myocytes. Um, this is putting on an inhibitor of KV1 channel SORA4 and showing that we can prevent uh, these downward deflections which signify open openings of single KV1 channels in these membrane patches. Um, we're able to isolate these because we're using some blockers of some other uh, potassium channels that are known to be highly expressed uh, in these cells. But just to, to highlight this configuration, what this allows us to do, so the inside-out configuration is basically when you would ex excise a patch of membrane that has uh, a channel or channels within the patch that you can actually measure the current or, or ion uh, uh, movement through the channel uh, as you expose uh, what's now become the intracellular part of the channel to the bath. So in this case, we wanted to perfuse on NADH and record uh, channel activity. And again, this was uh, this is would be the alpha complex, and these would be the beta uh, subunits facing the, the bath solution here. So uh, again, this basically uh, O1 and, and C. C is the closed state of the channel, and then O1 would be the a singular opening of single uh, a KV1 channel. So this is an, a rapid opening and closure of the channel, open closure, open closure. Uh, so you can see that these are, are very small currents. This is uh, around two picoamp. Uh, is the current uh, that you see. And again, it's a very fast uh, open and close, and these are completely uh, stochastic events. But it, what it allows us to do is to actually measure the, the probability that the channel spends in either the open, the amount of time the channel spends in the open or the closed state. So what we did was we recorded in a control condition, and then we applied one millimolar uh, NADH. And what I hope you can appreciate here is that the channel spends much more time in the open state when you apply uh, NADH to the bath solution, which can then interact with the intracellular part of the channel, which again is where the beta subunits reside. Uh, if you apply a blocker, again, to the bath uh, of KV1 channels for AP, you see that the activity is lost. This is uh, the summary data here showing that the uh, NPO, which is the open probability of the channel, is significantly increased uh, with NADH. Um, i move this out of the way. So this uh, is not observed with uh, NAD. So if you apply NAD, you don't see that big increase. Um, let's see, okay. So this is another way of looking at it. This is the change in, in open probability uh, with NADH compared to control. So again, in the wild type vessel, you see this, this large increase in, in uh, the open probability of the channel. Um, and then consistent with our, our uh, 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 previous results that I showed, you don't see this when you do this experiment with channels from uh, a KB beta 2 knockout, but you can still see it when, the, when you're using uh, a tissue or cells from the KB beta 1 knockout, suggesting that the beta 2 is crucial for this activation of the channel that then will lead to the hyperpolarization and the vasodilation of the vessel. This is looking uh, uh, at, um, we did these experiments now uh, at the tissue level Again, uh, using we did this in, in isolated coronary uh, arteries as well as mesenteric arteries, which also express uh, these channels and, and these subunits, where we apply lactate. And then again, you see this increase in arterial diameter, so that you can see the stepwise uh, vasodilation that's uh, reversible if you wash it out. Um, if you do this in the presence of a KV1 inhibitor, you don't see this effect. So this, again, is consistent with it being a KV1-mediated uh, effect. If you do the same experiment in, in a vessel from a KV beta 2 null animal, you don't see this lactate induced vasodilation. So it's consistent with that subunit being crucial for the vasodilatory uh, response. Um, if we do the same experiment in the beta 1.1 knockout, we don't see uh, that effect. We also tested uh, the effects of other 
uh, uh, vasodilatory uh, stimuli, uh, particularly adenosine, which has been proposed for, for decades to be a, a mediator of metabolic hyperemia, but it's been uh, reviewed, uh, refuted in the literature over the past uh, 10 years or so. Uh, what we saw was that knockout of these uh, subunits actually does not affect that. So it seems to be something that's specific for uh, what we think is a, a, a major shift in the purity nucleotide redox state uh, in these cells, which uh, presumably does not occur when you uh, apply adenosine uh, to the vessel. So, again, beta-2 is, is the essential subunit for vasodilation in response to changes in uh, cytosolic NADH. So, to summarize uh, this part of the talk, and then I'll just spend a few moments uh, going over the last part, uh, the beta-2 null mice have a disrupted relationship between cardiac workload and, and uh, myocardial blood flow. Uh, the beta subunits regulate uh, dilation in response to enhanced oxygen demand. Uh, higher cardiac workload promotes increased NADH to NAD in the arterial wall, uh, and we've seen this also in, in isolated uh, vascular smooth muscle cells. And then beta-2 subunits in the KB1 complex are required to the, uh, for increased channel activity in response to elevated NADH. Yeah. Okay, I have to give this biochemist a question. Sure. Uh, so, does this depend on mitochondrial activity in the vessel? We don't know. Huh. The short answer is we don't know uh, yet. Um, it and seems to be very fast. Yeah. So, we don't think so. Uh -huh. We don't think it would. Um, but. You know, one of the next experiments that's kind of on our list to do is just to do this in the presence of an LDH inhibitor and, and see if that will block it. Because if you can prevent the rise in NADH, you know, when you wash on a lactate, for example. And, and early on, you showed KB, so I noticed that NADH had a higher affinity mm -hmm. for and NADH. We haven't. That's also on our list to do, but we haven't. And wow. You're right. Yeah. I mean, Exactly, exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah, maybe not. Yeah. And, and the other thing what we're thinking is perhaps it might not be an NADPH effect acutely, but these pathways like the pentose phosphate pathway and, and where that can actually be adapted to affect the, the total purity nucleotide pool and, and redox state of the cell long term in disease states or, or with different adaptations. So. Yeah, it's, it's something that we have in our heads, but we haven't actually looked at yet. But just to go through the, the model uh, quickly, you know, what we think is, is happening is that these beta subunits are crucial because they can actually sense changes in purity nucleotide redox. And just, just by affecting the voltage sensitivity of the channel and shifting it so it's more sensitive to, to depolarization, what it can do is actually shift the, the, the the range of membrane potential where it can actually sense depolarization into the, the physiological uh, uh, range of membrane potentials in, in vascular smooth muscle cells, which in, in vascular smooth muscle is, is much different from a cardiomyocyte or a more excitable cell uh, like a neuron. It's a very tight window of membrane potentials, so it's usually around minus 60 to minus 35 is usually the difference between a completely dilated resistance vessel to a completely constricted resistance vessel. So it's a very, very small window, and we think this small shift in activation can play a, a huge role in regulating uh, this level of vasoconstriction. So really quick for the, the last uh, uh, part of the talk, uh, so again, the, the, our data suggests that an increase in, in KB beta-2 function, or really uh, the ratio of beta-2 to beta-1, because these are, are heteromers, can, can uh, profoundly influence the KB1 uh, activity. So we wanted to uh, uh, go further and see if this can actually uh, have any physiological relevance in, in uh, how the animal um, you know, would respond in this case to exercise, which is an important physiological stimulus for driving higher uh, myocardial oxygen consumption. Uh, so we did uh, some initial uh, exercise tests using uh, a model of force treadmill running uh, where we put wild type and, and uh, KB beta 2 null uh, mice on, on these treadmills. And then we just simply subjected them, them to this established uh, exercise capacity test where we're driving higher uh, speeds and, and incline angles until they reach an exhaustion, uh, a state of exhaustion, which is um, uh, 
uh, defined uh, with uh, a, a certain set of criteria. Uh, and indeed, what we're seeing is that these animals uh, that lack the KV beta 2 uh, subunits have significantly reduced uh, time that they spend in this protocol and, and the distance that they run and the work actually performed in the protocol until they, they reach uh, exhaustion. Um, we know they're reaching exhaustion because at the end of the protocol we're, we're measuring blood lactate levels and we're seeing it uh, uh, increase uh, to a significant degree in both animals. So we think that this is not simply due to um, some uh, behavioral modification due to the loss of this subunit. We actually do think this is, this is them reaching fatigue sooner. Um, so the next question um, is, is this lower uh, myocardial blood flow and the, this defect in, in the regulation of myocardial blood flow actually associated with impaired cardiac adaptations to long-term exercise conditioning uh, in KB beta 2 null mice? And so for this, we subjected these animals to a four-week uh, training period uh, where we uh, 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 slowly ramped up the amount of exercise they were performing e each week, and we did a, a exercise capacity test before uh, the four-week period and then afterwards before uh, sacrificing the, uh, the animal. So what we found was that even though these animals were not able to uh, perform to the same level in, in a capacity test, if we reduced uh, the intensity of the training down to 50% of their maximum capacity, they can actually comply to a four-week protocol to a similar degree. So this is uh, shown, you know, they completed a similar number of total exercise sessions and a total number uh, of minutes throughout this four-week period were similar for the beta-2 versus the wild-type uh, animals. Um, then what we did was we, we did the second exercise capacity test after these four weeks. And so in the wild type animals, what we found was that the work performed prior to the uh, exhaustion uh, as a measure of exercise capacity, you can actually see uh, an improvement in the, in the wild type animals, um, but not in the KV beta 2 null uh, uh, mice. So we thought that this uh, was uh, interesting because they were performing the same level of exercise throughout this period, the same amount of uh, work performed, but they weren't. Uh, improving to the same extent that a wild type uh, mouse was. Um, we did echocardiography on these mice, and the main thing that jumped out to us in terms, uh, we didn't see any uh, functional differences, and uh, this was done in, in anesthetized mice, but what stood out to us was actually the, uh, the wall uh, thickness uh, dimensions that we, we saw with these mice. So, you know, this uh, is uh, suggestive of, of an increase in, in or structural remodeling of the heart with the uh, posterior wall uh, uh, thickness and, and the relative wall thickness in the wild type exercise animals compared to the sedentary animals. Um, and we did not see uh, any change in this, uh, any of these with the KV beta 2 null mice. Um, we also uh, looked at heart weights, uh, heart weights normalized to tibial length and body weights. Uh, again, this was reflective of the same uh, effect where we saw this increase in heart mass uh, with the exercise animals. Yeah. Uh, is there any weight difference between wild types and knockouts? Between wild types and knockouts, no. You can see an increase in, in lean mass and a reduction in the fat mass in the exercise groups compared to each respective sedentaries, but between knockouts and, and the wild types, there's not. Um, but again, there's, there's no uh, change in, in heart mass uh, observed there. We looked at uh, biochemical markers of physiologic growth, uh, C, P, B, P, beta, and cited four are, are two that have been shown to be important in, in regulating uh, physiologic growth of the heart. Uh, we can see this uh, uh, change as expected in what's been shown in the past in exercise animals um, in the wild type mice, and we don't see this in the, the beta 2 nulls. Um, and FATC2 is, is a, a marker of uh, pathological growth, and you can normally see this go down in, in uh, exercise condition animals. Um, we also didn't see any change in this. Um, by histology, we looked at cardiomyocyte cross-sectional area, and this is the typical uh, hypertrophic response that you would see uh, in response to exercise conditioning uh, in the wild-type mice. And similar to the previous uh, data uh, slides that I show, there's no change uh, in this response in, in the KB beta-2 in all animals. So this is all uh, consistent with uh, KB beta-2 being uh, somehow very important for uh, regulating uh, physiologic growth in response to exercise. And again, I wanted to, to emphasize the point, these are performing the same level uh, or same amount of training throughout these, this four-week period. 
but they're, they're just not adapting in, in the same way. So current research questions that we're uh, currently working on is, uh, you know, what we're really interested in, in jumping off of these findings is looking at blood flow dependent mechanisms of myocardial uh, remodeling. And this is both in, in uh, uh, physiologic remodeling and pathologic uh, remodeling and how changes in blood flow uh, and keeping the balance of oxygen supply and demand can profoundly influence the metabolism of the myocardium and, and ultimately affect excitation contraction coupling and, and cardiac structure and mechanical function. Um, the last slide that I'll, I'll show uh, with data um, is uh, the generation of these novel uh, animals, uh, animal models that uh, can, we think can manipulate the metabolic sensitivity of these vascular uh, KV1 channels. So this gets at your, your question that you asked a little bit earlier. How do we actually know that this is something going on in, in the vessel? So what we did is we, we generated these uh, double transgenic mice. Uh, so these are TET on mice uh, in which, which feature a doxycycline inducible uh, beta-1 subunit and, and smooth muscle cells. So what we did was we created, uh, we had this uh, one transgenic line made that expresses um, uh, the, the, the gene for uh, uh, KV beta-1. Uh, this is one point, the 1.1 1 .1 variant downstream of the tetracycline response element. And we crossed this to a, a, an existing animal that we got from Jackson that expresses the reverse, trans, uh, the reverse tetra, tetracycline transactivator uh, downstream of uh, SM22. Uh, so it would be uh, uh, relatively selective for smooth muscle cells. And with the double transgenic, uh, what happens is when you give the animals doxycycline for eight to 10 days, you can actually drive uh, the expression of this uh, KV beta-1 uh, in uh, smooth muscle cells. So we did some uh, Western blots showing uh, in mesenteric arteries, you can increase the expression of KV beta-1 when you give, um, when you compare this to the single transgenics, which have the, the, the transactivator, but not the, the downstream uh, beta-1 uh, gene. Uh, we don't see this effect in the same animals in, in the brain tissue. So we think this is relatively selective for uh, smooth muscle cells. Um, we looked, so this was in mesenteric arteries. We also did more uh, proximity ligation where we looked at the interactions between uh, the different subunits and we saw that the interactions between beta-1 and KB1.5 were significantly increased in these uh, animals. And interestingly, if you look at the interactions between KB1.5 and beta-2 in myocytes from those animals, we actually see that that's actually a, a, the level of interactions actually go down in those animals. So if you drive more, suggesting that if you drive more interactions with beta-1 with 1.5, it actually will uh, decrease uh, the level of interactions with the other major beta subunit that's found in, in the channel. So functionally, what does this mean? Well, so we took out uh, mesenteric arteries from these animals and again, uh, looked at their response to lactate. And again, you could see the stepwise increase in, in arterial diameter in response to, to increasing levels of, of lactate, but it's completely abolished in the, uh, the vessels that are isolated from the double transgenic mice. So again, if you remember back to the, the KV beta-2 null data where we did the same experiment, when you knock out beta-2, you see the same thing. If you overexpress the opposite subunit, which again has this N-terminal inactivation domain and, and uh, suggests that it actually can, can lead to more channel inhibition, then that actually can, can have the same effect as knocking out the, the subunit that can actually increase its activity. Um, we looked in vivo at the relationship between blood flow and, and uh, uh, cardiac work. And similar, again, to that uh, knockout of the beta-2, we saw that this uh, relationship is, is uh, significantly blunted uh, in these uh, double transgenic mice compared to the single transgenics. Um, so we think that this will uh, allow us to address more of these specific questions about how can we manipulate the channel to become more or less sensitive to, to redox changes in the cell and ultimately uh, more selectively control blood flow, uh, in this case to the heart, um, but possibly in other uh, organs as well. So just to kind of summarize, rather than uh, uh, bullets, I'll, I'll just kind of give you an overview. What we think uh, our working model of this is, is that KV1 activity in myocardial blood flow is, is heavily dependent on the level of KV beta 2 to, to beta 1 uh, in the KV1 channels in uh, uh, the coronary uh, arterial myocytes. And so, 
you know, again, these are heteromeric uh, structures. So if you change the ratio of this, as we did with that inducible transgenic model, you can actually shift this towards uh, lower levels of blood flow. And so we think that the reason for these heteromers, and, and it's kind of speculating more here, but, you know, one of the things we think could be happening is in different uh, adaptive states, the cell could actually change the composition of the channel to actually precisely fine tune blood flow, and this, you know, in disease states, actually could uh, lower the the level of the response to changes in in metabolism and in, in the cell. Um, but again, you know, where I want to kind of bring this back to, uh, you know, endocrinology and and how this could be affected by different disease states, not only the ratio of beta two to beta one, but upstream of that, how the cell actually could alter its metabolism to change. Uh, the redox state of these uh, purity nucleotides could be uh, something that's uh, very plastic in the cell, um, such that uh, some stimulus could actually uh, chronically change myocardial and vascular metabolism and alter the way that, that the redox actually would respond to uh, uh, more oxygen demand uh, in the heart. And so with that, uh, it's almost the top of the hour, so I'll end and just acknowledge uh, the people that uh, did this work. Uh, Mark and, and Sean did a lot of the electrophysiology and myography data in the lab. Um, Jumei uh, did a lot of the work with uh, the, the uh, uh, proximity ligation and the Westerns, and, and John and Ernesto did a lot with uh, the exercise uh, model. Uh, also other collaborators, uh, Dr. Botnagar, uh, Dr. Jones, especially in, in the Diabetes and Obesity Center, have been a, a huge help. And then uh, collaborators outside, um, uh, specifically Bill and uh, Bahan at Northeast Ohio uh, Medical University, helped a lot with our in vivo blood flow measurements. And then the Vanderbilt Mass Spectrometry uh, Facility, uh, led by uh, Dr. Caprioli, has been a huge help. And finally, our uh, funding sources uh, for all of their support. And with that, I will end and take uh, any questions. You have so much data, it's just amazing. Thanks. Um, so you mentioned about splice variants, and I uh, that can play a role in uh, regulating the beta uh, subunit function as well. And, and so are there any alternating in splice variants or in splicing factors in disease states? Yeah, within. Within a set of you know of gene products for for one of these subunits, you know there I think there's three major known variants of the beta one and two major known variants of the beta two. How how they actually you know may you know uniquely regulate the channel? Very little is actually known about that. Um, but certainly it's it's a possibility. Yeah, that's that's another mode of. You know, because so one of the pieces of data with at least with the beta one that we think it's mostly the beta 1.1 variant uh, that that's doing something is when we knock out what well, we have the knockout of the, the beta 1.1, at least with mice, you can see that the interactions of any when you stain or, or do any uh, proximity ligation with a pan beta one antibody you actually see most of the signal gone. So we think that the beta 1.1 is, is more of kind of a muscle selective splice variant. But that's not to say that in certain conditions you can't see another one go up or down. Um, and, and I will say with the knockout, we haven't actually looked to see if the 1.2 variant or the, or the 1.3 variant actually could go up to compensate that. Um, but it's it's, Certainly possible that you know, and, and other uh, tissues too. I think in in like portal vein smooth muscle, like people have shown that there are actually multiple splice variants expressed in, in different vas vascular beds. So, yeah, yeah, and that's one of the things that I think makes it a little bit challenging, you know, because they're all interacting together within the same channel. So, it's How long great. does it take to change these? The subunit expression. Um, you mean with with like our transgenic model or? No, I mean does does it change or say if I exercise will it change? We've we've seen some changes at the protein level in, in abundance of of 1.5 and uh, uh, we can see beta two go uh, up at at least at the transcript level we can see the beta two subunit go up. We've only looked at four weeks, um, but it, it may occur. Sooner than that. 
So yeah, on the order of weeks, certainly, I think they could they could be adapted. So then, what determines the that's a, that's a good question. So what's the the you know the transcription transcriptional regulatory pathways? Mm, we we haven't gone there just yet actually to to look at that. Um, you know whether it's uh, you know the the first one that I go to when I think of, of something like this is something that's oxygen sensitive like the HIF one alpha pathway or something like that or PGC one alpha. Or, um, but you know, to look in, in one of those uh, knockout models to see if you, we yeah, we just haven't looked there. But but yeah, I mean, it's our our idea is that it's something that is is regulated by oxygen and and oxidative metabolism potentially. And, and but yeah, we we aren't certain of that yet. Just from a mechanical perspective, what we want to know is, well, having this. What can I do? Right. Make it more right. The other thing that we've been thinking about too is that there are some studies showing that rather than changing the expression, there are some compounds that actually can dislodge the beta subunits from the alpha subunits. And so cortisone and cortisone analogs are actually one uh, group of compounds that can actually displace the ancillary subunit complex. So you know, if there's some analog or, or some other compound that could be more specific and, and just for, say, the beta-1, which we think is inhibitory, if that could potentially lead to, you know, some therapeutic strategy that could, could you know, somebody that has microcirculatory dysfunction. Because I think what it, it's about changing the sensitivity of the channel to metabolism, right, and just altering the sensor, you know, is, is what we're really interested in going after. So that's that's one avenue that we've been thinking about. The, the microvascular is also dependent on the microvascular. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So yeah, with like flow mediated dilation of the downstream arteries and the perfusion pressure changes, and that's a good point. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, so so if you give like nitroglycerin or something like that, would that affect this pathway? That's a good point. Yeah, not sure of that. Yeah. Okay, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, can dietary uh, potassium intake influence any of the parameters that you have studied? So with high potassium, so this is where my lack of clinical knowledge will actually come into play. But I, I wonder with. Um, you know, people that have high levels of circulating potassium, if it's the one way I could, you know, think of it possibly affecting this pathway, if it if it's high enough to actually affect the driving force for potassium to, you know, efflux from the cell. I don't know if, you know, the gradient for potassium is already very high. You know, it's, you know, 140 millimolar in the cell versus around five or six millimolar in the plasma, right? So. Yeah. I don't know if uh, a rise in or a fall in potassium in the plasma would be enough. I don't know if you've seen certainly with you know cardiac exactly. repolarization and things One like of the that. We have is you know many of the people who have cardiac disease are on agents that actually make you lose potassium, like you know your own diabetic. Um, mm -hmm. So in which case, and we know that those things cause arrhythmias. Right. Right. Can you repeat the comment of uh, Dr. Mokshigan? Yeah, so he, he was saying that, uh, you know, people that are on uh, different therapeutics that would, would serve to lower uh, potassium, um, basically there's there's risk of, of arrhythmia uh, with these and, you know, through altering uh, repolarization patterns in the heart. So um, I guess certainly it's it's possible through through changing the driving force for potassium that it could affect this pathway as well. I don't know if, if those patients would also have uh, blood pressure effects just from the potassium. Other, I don't know if there are effects on blood pressure from that. Yeah, yeah, it's it's. I don't know. It's certainly something I can look for in the literature. It's a good question. Thank you. I don't know. Let me open the chat here and see. I don't know if there's any more questions. I don't I've never used blue jeans before, so I don't know where the chat actually okay. is here. I guess I could say if there are questions in the yeah. chat and I'm not seeing them, then. 
Okay. There we go. That's the code. Okay, do you, th oh, Helen. Okay, so do you think that your KB beta 2 exercise findings would hold true in other physiological models of cardiac growth, such that that's seen as during, during pregnancy? That's something that we've been wanting to do, is to see um, if these animals uh, that lack beta 2 also have uh, uh, defects in, in the cardiac, or the, yeah, the cardiac growth to pregnancy. We haven't looked at that, but it's, it's certainly possible. Um, and if it's a blood flow mediated effect, I'd, I'd have to look to see, um, you know, if there are adaptations in, in the blood flow and, and uh, you know, if, if there's, I, I would answer the question to say, certainly if, if there are, if there's any inadequate blood flow to the heart or, or mismatch or, or, or modest ischemia that's occurring uh, because of this in, in pregnancy, I, I think it's certainly plausible that that could, could happen. Um, but it's it's definitely something we've we've been wanting to test as well. All right. So I guess if there's no more questions, thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Bye.